In the very beginning of this year, I enthusiastically shouted from the rooftops that RDNA 2 was going to be very impressive when I saw the back of the Xbox Series X. What it showed was a power connector input of the same caliber to current gen consoles. And that means this next gen console that had a graphics card performance around a 2080 Super or 2080 Ti, the whole thing, including an 8-core in the APU, had to be using less than 250 watts. And now with Microsoft's Hot Chips presentation, we know that's for sure true. And not just true, they targeted the same power consumption of previous gen. Now, at the end of the day, what we'll say is this. A 52CU RDNA 2 card running at about the same clocks as RDNA 1 is using the same amount of energy of a 5700. That's right, despite having 44% more CUs. Guys, at this point, it's abundantly clear that that 1.8 gigahertz clock speed inside the Xbox Series X is not just at the power efficiency curve. It's probably a bit below it to be conservative, and the PlayStation 5's high boost clocks are probably just a tad above it. And so we know that little bit more about RDNA 2, once again, from a console presentation, not an official one from AMD. Which brings me to the subject of this video. There's a bunch of different things I could have covered from the first day of Hot Chips presentations, but it's gonna be this, having to do with the consoles and RDNA 2. AMD has been hiding RDNA 2's true performance Pretty well, actually. It's proven very elusive to guess how good top RDNA 2 is going to be versus Ampere. I'll just speak for myself. I feel like I've known most things about Ampere for months now. Whereas we're still connecting the dots from little snippets that come out of Sony or Microsoft. And so at the end of the day, here's what it comes down to. Either AMD is hiding an enormous beast in RDNA 2 or... At this point, it's starting to feel like Microsoft and Sony are better at designing a graphics card with AMD's IP than Radeon is. And to illustrate this, I want to actually talk about Navi 22 a bit. Most people, understandably, seem to be focusing on what I would call biggest Navi, Navi 21. You know, the one that should go up to 80 compute units, at least for the full die. But I think Navi 22 sounds much more exciting. Based on other available information that's been leaked a while ago, it sounds like there is a Navi 22 that's about two-thirds the die size of Navi 21. And so that should, as I've covered in previous videos, line up to be somewhere between, I don't know, 56 to 64 compute units. And it kind of sounds like it's basically just a... GPU version of what's in the Xbox Series X, although of course adapted in some ways uh, to maximize its performance on a less constrained uh, desktop than a compact efficient console. If we look at this slide here from Xbox's presentation, we can see that the GPU takes up, I don't know, somewhere around 80% of the die. Now, you might say then, okay, so a 56 compute unit RDNA 2 card should be what, around 300 millimeter square? I would say, Maybe, but I have been told that Microsoft sacrificed what you some die space to make it run at a fixed frequency and put the CUs as closely together at the lower clock speed. They want to fit as many CUs as possible in an economical to produce package that doesn't boost a lot. So maybe on desktop, because of course it will boost higher, it might be about 10% bigger. But at the end of the day, what I would say is this. Based on this, we can very safely say, I think, that a 56CU RDNA 2 card would be a bit bigger than the 5700 XT, but probably top off around an RDNA, um, a Radeon 7's die size. Now, a lot of people would say, isn't the Radeon 7 a big graphics card? And I would say, no, it's actually pretty small, all things considered. It was somewhat big for being on an immature node in 2018 when Vega 20 launched, but since then, 7 nanometer at TSMC has hit some pretty record high yield rates. You know, we should be comparing the die size of something around a Radeon 7 to the more mature 
mid-range cards we've seen in the past, like the R9 380X. That was a $230 card that was 366 millimeter squared. And even outrageously priced Turing had the RTX 2070 with a 445 millimeter squared die priced at about $500. In other words, I, I think the evidence is clear based on everything we're seeing from the slides and the performance numbers coming out. There should be a card between $400 and $500 that has 40% more CUs than the 5700 XT that can boost 10 to 15% higher and that even if it just uses a 256-bit memory interface, I've been told they're going to use GDR6X. And so with 19 gigabit per second memory, which should be in the RTX 3080, you can get 36% more bandwidth with just 8 gigabytes of RAM. And... Heck, the cut down version could just use 16 gigabit per second dirt cheap GDR6 and bring you something probably 20% better than a 5700 XT. Again, reiterating my main point, all data suggests that AMD can make something that costs about as much as a 5700 XT right now with modern yields and GDR6 that is about 30 to 40% better and probably doesn't use much more energy, if more energy at all. Either that, or this has to be true then. Microsoft and Sony are lying or are better at designing a graphics card with AMD's IP than Radeon themselves are. And it doesn't stop at rasterization performance either. If we look at the ray tracing slide, it's honestly still pretty hard to do an apples to apples comparison with Turing. But it seems like the Xbox Series X, at the very least, with its version of RDNA, can use the TMUs as ray tracing cores. And that because it can do this, it can get ray tracing performance that on paper should dwarf what's even in a Titan RTX. However, that comes with a caveat. If it's doing ray tracing ops, it has to be sacrificing some of the other ops. So there are trade-offs here. This leads to... You know, this connects with a lot of the other rumors we've heard that RDNA 2, like, repurposes some of its components to do ray tracing, and that if you balance it right, you can get it for almost free, but then you can also make it really, really powerful, but then you'll lose a bunch of rasterization performance directly. I'm not actually going to focus on the GigaRay numbers because I don't think they're directly comparable. What I do want to focus on is the 3 to 10x acceleration. That's pretty similar to what NVIDIA said Turning did over Pascal. Although, let's focus on the 3X, because 3 to 10X is quite a ridiculously huge range, if you ask me. And then, let's pull up the Neo Noir demo. Remember, this is a third-party ray tracing demo that we can actually use as not a perfect data point, not even potentially as an unbiased one, but it is a data point of comparing, you know, Pascal, Turing, GCN, and RDNA ray tracing performance. If we assume something around the performance of a 5700 XT is RDNA 2 and can perform three times better, yeah, it looks like it might do it better than a Titan RTX, but one has to assume that it would lose some rasterization performance. And actually, that gets me to what I think that 10x acceleration is. I believe really big Navi, with all of those, you might even argue, extra CUs, may use them for that hyper acceleration of ray tracing performance. But then, in the mid-range, it's probably going to be closer to, I don't know, again, it looks like better than Turing, but not as good as Ampere. Uh, but at least the entire lineup should have it. And again, that lines up with everything we've heard, that RDNA 2 should be significantly better at ray tracing than Turing in practice, but that Ampere is still going to have an edge. And so yeah, I guess to summarize what I'm saying here, it looks like there will be a Navi 22 that is significantly higher performance than the 5700 XT, that this should be a mid-range die that performs above a 2080 Super, and that there should be a die with 80 CUs, you know, a die 40 to 50% bigger than that. And that could be really powerful. Now, you'll notice that throughout this video, I kept saying should. It's because I don't want to overhype RDNA 2. I don't want to be an AM delusional. I just have to say, like, I, you've got to be ignoring the numbers everyone's putting out there if you don't see how powerful RDNA 2 should be. Or you got to at least start making the argument 
that Sony and Microsoft are lying. That's the argument you need to start making if you think RDNA 2 can't get decently above a 2080 Ti. Either these companies are lying or they're better at designing graphics cards than AMD themselves is with the same IP, which I suppose could be possible. I have heard Sony engineers laughing about how they are better at designing Radeon cards than Radeon is, but I always took it as arrogance. You know, Sony engineers really seem to think they're really smart, by the way, guys. That probably doesn't surprise anybody. And with word coming out that the 3090 will have 24 gigabytes of memory, but in response, maybe cost $2,000, and that there might be no 3080 Ti, just a 3080. And by the way, that would be because I think they're going to push the 3080 super hard. I really hope these numbers are correct so NVIDIA can't launch cards at that high of a price. Although I do know that NVIDIA is probably launching the 3080 and the 3090 and saving the ability to launch a 3080 Ti and a Titan above both of those cards once they see what AMD's actually got. And so, I guess that's my last message. I have been told directly that the 3080 and the 3090 are being announced soon. In fact, that the teasers or a full unveiling may even come out as early as the 21st. Not the 31st, I'm being told the 21st. And this is the same person who told me about Matisse 2 and so on and so forth. So, yeah, we know what NVIDIA is planning. A really, really powerful upgrade. One that we saw, like, from Maxwell to Pascal... And one that's reserving a couple of cards, like the 3080 Ti and the Titan, in case they need to release them. They don't want to have to, and they want to be able to charge probably $1,000 for the 3080 and 2000 for the 3090. And it's on AMD to hold NVIDIA to not raise prices. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is just the first of many pieces of content that will come out of covering hot chips. This was the first thing I thought of to discuss. And so if you enjoyed this video, don't miss the rest of the coverage. Subscribe to the Moore's Law is Dead YouTube channel. Ring the bell button. Share these videos so other people also don't miss it. And if you have the extra money, consider supporting us on Patreon. It helps fund audio engineers, me, Dan, the co-host of Broken Silicon, our podcast, and much more. And of course, as always, Thank you for watching.